And, and believe it or not, we've, we've touched on a number of thing, these things already. Um, so again, I'll say nuclear medicine in an hour. Hmm. A little bit of a whirlwind tour, but hopefully we've talked about some of these things enough. Remember in that first lecture, we talked about the four forces, right? Gravity, the electromagnetic force, the strong force, the thing that kind of holds the uh, fundamental particles together. And the weak force, I said, was important in beta decay. And we're going to talk a little bit about beta decay. It's not going to be necessarily that we understand the weak force, but, but it is what plays a role in that nuclear phenomenon such as beta decay there. Here's our atom. We talked about it quite a bit when we talked about x-ray imaging. Now we're going to talk about nuclear medicine imaging, which in large part, some of what we're going to image with uh, originates from the nucleus of the atom rather than from the electron shell. And that's not completely true. There are certain things we're going to image with where we're not actually using the gamma rays that are produced to do the imaging. And we'll, we'll make a specific example of some of those things. I show this again, rem reminding you of the rest mass energy of the electron. If we converted all of the electron's energy, I'm sorry, all of its mass to energy, we'd get 511 keV. We're going to see that number pop up, of course, when we talk about positron emission tomography, where we're going to take the positron, which is the antimatter equivalent of the electron. It has a positive charge, but the same mass. And it's going to annihilate with an electron. And we're going to convert both of their masses into pure energy. And we're going to get two 511 keV photons that we're going to then use to image. So let's talk about some nuclear structure and get some terms cor correct first. We're going to talk a little bit about isotopes. So these are atoms with the same number of protons, right? So, so they're all going to be, let's say, oxygen atoms. They're just going to have varying numbers of neutrons, but all have the same number of protons. And of course, they're all oxygen atoms because it's the number of protons that defines what element the atom is, OK? We're going to talk a little bit about isotones, which are atoms that have the same number of neutrons. And it turns out that we can utilize some of these to create some of the radioactive uh, uh, elements that we're going to utilize in imaging. There's also a concept called isobars. These are atoms that have the same atomic mass number. So if you add up the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, those are the same. The term isomer, which is the excited nuclear state of an atom, and we're going to talk about that when we talk about isomeric transition and the gamma ray that's given off from that. And I want to distinguish all those names from the ion, right, which is the atom that has more or less electrons than protons and therefore either has a, positive char a net positive charge or a net negative charge. So here's oxygen. Right, all atoms with eight protons are oxygen atoms, and oxygen can have a variable number of neutrons. The most abundant oxygen isotope is O16, eight protons, eight neutrons, and in fact, 99.762% of all naturally occurring oxygen occurs in that form. Uh, there's O17 and O18, by the way, both of these are stable. They don't radi go undergo radioactive decay. And a very small percentage of the natural occurring oxygen is in those two forms. So this form with eight protons and nine neutrons, O18, eight protons and 10 neutrons. As a matter of fact, you can use O18 to make F18 if you want, uh, that we're going to use to, to image and pet. And I guess all you need to go out, and there's plenty of seawater out there, right? And 0.2% of it is going to be in the form that we would need to, to do that. Here's fluorine. Fluorine has nine protons. It turns out that there's only one stable isotope of fluorine, and that's F19. Notice this is the first uh, element that has an excess of neutrons to protons. Up until this point, the no with the exception of hydrogen, which only has a proton in its nucleus, right? Helium, two protons, two neutrons. As we go up, three and three, four and four, five and five. Carbon, 6 and 6. Nitrogen, 7 and 7. We just did oxygen, 8 and 8. And here we are at fluorine where we've got 10 neutrons to go with the, the 9 protons. And I'm going to make a point of this excess of neutrons in a second. F18 we're familiar with. It's that, it's that radioactive isotope used in PET. And of course, F18 and O18, right, they're isobars of each other because they both have uh, their, the sum of their protons plus their neutrons are the same. 
So here are isotopes. O16, O17, and O18 are all isotopes. They have the same number of protons. O18 and F19 are isotones. This has 10 neutrons, and this has 10 neutrons. And O18 and F18 are isobars, the same atomic mass number. So here, here's a picture from an older version of Huda, Huda and Sloan's book, and I'm going to adapt it a little bit as we talk a little bit. So as we take a look at all of the nuclei that are out there, we'll notice that there's a, a certain uh, ratio of their protons to neutrons that occurs. But let's first kind of mark the things that we just talked about. So these vertically oriented lines are the isotopes, the things that have a constant number of protons are, ve are vertically oriented lines. And I've drawn in here at about the level of eight protons, the line that corresponds to where the isotopes of oxygen would fall. Here are the isotones, the things that have the same number of neutrons, and of course these would have variable numbers of protons. So there's O18, F19, the things we talked about. And of course on this line are the isobars, things that have the sum of the protons plus, plus the neutrons being the same. This graph shows, I've drawn some of the different uh, atoms on, on this, some of the elements. Here's oxygen, O16 here. Here's molybdenum, uh, the 42nd uh, element. It's got 42 protons. And here's tungsten. We've met tungsten before with its 74 protons. You know, it turns out, as we've already mentioned, oxygen has three stable isotopes. Uh, molybdenum has six stable isotopes. And tungsten has three. So this notion that there's this simple curve of stable nuclides is, is really an incorrect one. This is really a better picture of how things look. The black dots on this picture correspond to the stable uh, isotopes. Um, and the things above that black line in blue, you notice these are the things that decay by beta minus decay. And the orange things are the things that decay by beta plus decay, and we'll talk about what that is in a little bit. And the things that are colored yellow here are things that decay by alpha decay that we'll look, look at. And then down here there's a, a few other things that I'm, I'm not really going to get into in terms of some decay scheme. But take a look at some of the things here. For instance, here at, at 82, look at how many as we go across, right, things with, are stable that have various numbers of protons but have a fixed number of neutrons there at 82. And there's a number of stable isotones there with 82 neutrons. And, and here is the list of them. Here are those five things, all of which have 82 neutrons that are stable. Then also if you look right here, notice how many dark black lines there are here right at this 50 level, right? Those are all the stable isotopes containing 50 protons. Notice how many of them there are. It turns out that that's 10. 10 has 10 stable isotopes, by, by far the most here. So it's not as simple as a single curve with one at each point that does that. But there's a general trend here. Does everyone see that general trend? Right, this line, this dark line, is the line at which the number of protons and the number of uh, neutrons would be equal to each other. So does everyone see that as the number of protons in an atom gets bigger, it turns out that you have to have a relative excess in the number of neutrons in order to have nuclear stability there, right? And that's helpful to us in that we can sort of predict a little bit as what the decay scheme might be by knowing whether you exist up in this blue region, right? You have more neutrons than you need. You have an excess of neutrons. Or if you're down in this region, where I guess you would say you have either a relative paucity of neutrons or perhaps too many protons. And that's going to help us decide what the decay scheme is going to be there. So going back to that picture, right, these are the things that have too few neutrons, or if you will, have too many protons relative to neutrons. And these are the things that have too many neutrons, or if you will, have too few protons relative to the neutrons there. Here's that nuclear binding energy we talked about, right? The, 
most stable thing sitting in this range. And so things up in this range are really going to decay into that region to try and make things become more stable. So by way of review, right, nuclei with different numbers of protons or neutrons are called nuclides. Unstable nuclei are called radionuclides, not radionucleotides. We're not studying RNA or DNA. Um, atoms with unstable nuclei are, nuclei are called radioisotopes. So here are some of the hydrogen isotopes, right? Uh, the deuterium, tr tritium, uh, there. So unstable nuclei become stable via radioactive decay. That decay may give off energy in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, pure energy, gamma ray photons, or it may give off particles, or frankly some things decay using both schemes. The four processes are isomeric transition, alpha decay, beta decay, and gamma decay, and I'm going to go, go through those uh, here in a second. Um, isomeric transition, alpha, beta, uh, gamma, um, electron capture, actually, I should have here. So the parent radionuclide decays to a, a, a more stable daughter. The combination of energy, mass, and charge has to be conserved in that. So, so what is radioactivity? Well, activity is the rate of change of the parent into the daughter. So if we have n number of parent atoms at a given time t, it turns out that that rate of change, the change in the parent per unit time, is simply proportional to the number of parent that's present 